those challenges. So I don't know how much time I've got now. What's that? Oh, sweet. Okay. So we still have time to talk about my Sunny Guild. Now, this is Sunny Guild. I, I cobbled together a few plants that can grow in the sun. If I'm designing, if I'm really designing a guild of plants, I'm probably going to think a little bit more about it than, hey, I've got a whole bunch of unusual plants. What can I put together? I'm going to think about, uh, you know, is there a nitrogen fixer in the mix? If there's something that's, that's a heavy nitrogen user, is a dy dynamic accumulator in the mix like comfrey that's going to help bring up nutrient from underground? But given the, the, the plants that I had to choose from, I cobbled together the Sunny Guild. Um, and I know, once again, this, I think this is sort of a pattern I've been using two very identifiable plants and one that's a little harder to. So who can tell me what the middle plant is? Is that a honeyberry? Bingo! All right. All right, so I haven't stumped any of you yet. That was one of my goals was to stump. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, that is a honeyberry. So we'll talk about that in, uh, in just a second. But we're going to start with the wild strawberry, a.k.a. the alpine strawberry. This is When you're looking in seed catalogs, you're going to find a lot of alpine strawberries. They're not alpine, most of them. Most of them are just wild strawberries. So in the early 1700s, France sent to Chile uh, an explorer and botanist and spy um, whose name I'm not going to remember, but his first name is Francois. So Francois goes over and his under the auspices of studying botany, he's actually studying the fortifications. So he can report back to Louis XIV, tell them what the Spanish fortifications are in Chile. What he discovers there is a domesticated um, form of the wild strawberry. And wild strawberry has been very popular in Europe for a long time. But this domesticated variety that he finds that's domesticated from a West Coast uh, version of the of the strawberry west coast of the of the Americas is it's got berries that are about that size so he takes five of these back to King Louis XIV and these become popular in French gardens meanwhile somebody had begun bringing a a wild wild strawberry back from the Virginias this may have been a strawberry that was domesticated by the indigenous peoples in the United States we don't really know because we, uh, we didn't have anybody to ask by that point, but they bring this version back and, um, and are growing it in, in England and, uh, and also in Europe. These two meet in a garden in France and become what is now our modern day garden strawberry. Um, so the modern strawberry is descendant of, uh, of a, uh, a combination of of a couple of strawberries that were closer to wild strawberries. Um, but the strawberry, the, the wild strawberry has been around for ages, quoted, you know, discussed by Virgil. Um, you know, just, it's been, a, it's been a popular fruit for a long, long time. There are white or red varieties. I've also seen white varieties that have sort of a little bit of red speckling around the seeds, beautiful. Um, widely available through seed companies. Many varieties are ever bearing and most spread by clumping. There are only a few varieties that, that send out runners. I have it like runners because it will form a, 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 a mat more quickly than sort of these, these clumping varieties. I call them clumping. I don't think anybody else calls them clumping varieties. It's the only way I can describe them. Um, they, those will spread, the, the types that, that don't have runners, they'll spread, but more slowly. The, the runner varieties, one like, that I like, um, is, is called Attila uh, by uh, Baker Creek. They also have a, a great variety, a, a white, yellow variety called Yellow Wonder, which I also have and which I started from seed. But they are, they are tricky to start from seed, so uh, you want to use a lot of seeds and you know, scatter them on damp medium, keep it damp uh, for a while, and just when you think it's not going to happen, you'll start to see tiny little... Um, uh, strawberry plants grow up that you can then uh, nurture in through their first year or so, and then and then they'll they'll establish themselves as a very it, the runner variety, the Attila variety. This is Attila established itself as a very dense ground cover, which works great. One of the problems with 
garden strawberries is they tend to suck a lot of nutrients out of the soil. And so if you, if you use them as a ground cover, and permaculturists love to have ground covers, like living ground covers, if you use them as that, what's going to happen is after four or five years, they're going to start, start dying back because they can't, um, they, they can't sustain themselves. They've, they've sucked all the nutrient out of the soil. So I have not found that problem with the Attila um, uh, wild strawberry. It's, uh, it's been a great ground cover. I have mixed it in with a few other plants. And uh, I actually have it growing with sea kale and with some fruit trees, and it's provided a great ground cover. We stopped really aggressively mulching the garden. We still, in the spring, we'll still put down some, um, like salt marsh hay or something around the plants. But salt marsh hay is a great mulch, great seedless mulch for anybody who doesn't know. Um, and it's available around here. So they're very sweet. The kids at the school garden that I, that I used to work with used to uh, compare them to Pez. Um, and so anything kids are comparing to candy is, is definitely something that you're going to want to pursue. Um, the honeyberry could not be compared to candy in general. It's, a, it's, it's like a more sour blueberry in flavor, but it has some really nice characteristics. It is a flowering honeysuckle. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a flowering, it's a fruiting honeysuckle. So you get honeysuckle. This is another great stealth edible. Um, is the honeyberry because you plant this in your front yard? People just think you planted uh, you planted uh, honeysuckle, and they will approve. Um, but then you sneak out at night and eat the berries. The um, the 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 berries you're going to want to try very hard to leave them on the bush for a couple of weeks after they turn blue, because when they just turn blue they're very sour. If you, if you can manage to keep them on the bush for two or three more weeks, they will sweeten up. The tough part is um, that the birds love them. And so if you really want to keep them on your bushes, you probably will need to find some defense, um, you know, whether that's some sort of uh, fabric or something to, uh, to keep the birds away. Um, you'll need to have a strategy with that if you want to actually ever taste the sweet honeyberry because it takes them takes them a little while. However, they are very, very early fruiting berry. So it'll be one of the first things to fruit to, you know, to actually ripen uh, as a berry in your in your garden. So it's great early fruit. And sometimes earlier in the season you're less particular about how sweet something is. You're just so excited to have something to put on your cereal. Yes. So is it fruiting really at the flower really hmm? I haven't had problems with oh you know, here's the thing. These these are Arctic fruit. And so it's possible that that could happen, theoretically possible. They can, they can grow up to like, the, they're, they're like Siberian hardy fruit. So I haven't had problems with that, but theoretically it could happen. You're right, especially the wackiness of our weather these days. Yeah, yeah, the wackiness of our weather these days. Uh, it's hard to say. I haven't seen it happen, but I'm not going to say that what I have seen means, you know, anything in terms of what could happen. They're shallow rooted. They're easy to relocate. Um, you, they are not, they, they are uh, self sterile. They're not, they're not cross poll. They, they need cross pollinators. So you need to have several different varieties. So if you're buying a named variety, don't just get two of the same named variety. You're going to need um, two different varieties. And they do have different times when they might um, flower. So you're, the best source of information for that is a good um, uh, company that, that sells them. And I've got some on the, um, on the handout that I've got. There's, I think there's a suggestion for honey bizarre, but there, it may not be because it's pretty widely variety, uh, available at this point. But like I said, favorite of birds. Are they slow growing? I haven't found so. I mean, they're not, they're not super fast. Yeah. Um, I, but I haven't found that they're, I wouldn't call them slow growing, kind of average growing in terms of speed. Do you, uh, does anybody else have any experience and input in that in terms of speed? Yeah, I've, I haven't found them to be too slow growing. Um, all right, so here we have the Asian pear. Now, Asian pears, you can get them in the supermarket. Most people have tasted Asian pears. How many people have not tasted an Asian pear? Okay, so they're absolutely... Delicious. If you have the right, if you if it's if it's a ripe Asian pear, 
uh, if it's, uh, you know, anything you buy in the supermarket is usually picked a little too early. But uh, an Asian pear at perfection is, it tastes like honey. Well, it depends on the variety, but, but the, it's a very, very sweet fruit. Um, they made their way from Asia, uh, early 1800s. Um, some varieties can store for a very long time, like the Korean giant, very, very large fruit. That'll store for nine months um, in, in proper storage. Very sweet, great for fresh eating, but like I say, store for quite a long time. High water content, so they're very crisp, um, but spectacular. But one of the best things about them is there's very little pest pressure on Asian pears. Um, there are some diseases that, you, that, that Asian pears get, but I haven't had any problems at all. And from people I've talked to who grow them, they really, really are very, very much pest-free. These here uh, were grown in the school garden that I was um, working on. Zero pesticides on these. And they come out looking like that. So they're absolutely super easy. And one of the things about permaculture is you're looking for the you're looking for the easy score too. You know, you don't want to necessarily grow the thing that's the hardest to grow, um, because I think permaculturists are are very they want to put in the, the work up front and then not necessarily have to put in quite as much work as time goes by. They want to focus on the harvesting in later years, not having to retail the garden again. And so Asian pears um, are a great a great fruit for that. I, probably people have heard of the Liberty Apple, which is, you know, an apple variety that's less. Oh, yeah, one minute. Okay, good. Yeah.